Welcome to Poker Power's session today on basic gameplay and tournament strategy. I am Erin Leiden, and along with a team of amazing women, I lead Poker Power. Poker Power was founded on the belief that teaching girls and women a game of skill and strategy could transform the next generation of female leaders. And I truly believe that poker is a solution to advancing women in the workplace by giving them a toolkit to stack their skills and win. In partnership with World College Poker, the leading provider of on-campus tournaments and poker education, we are hosting No Limits, a first of its kind, global, all women poker tournament to be held on Saturday, March 27th, so that's next Saturday, at three o'clock Eastern. The event is powered by PokerStars.net and it's completely free to register. There's no buy-ins. And the final table will win amazing prizes. For example, a private lesson with poker great Jonathan Little, vacation packages, swag and an engraved trophy from Poker Stars, and a private poker party with Poker Power's own Melanie Wisner and Schwan Liu. Whether you are a beginner or advanced, all are welcome. We really want you to come and take your seat at the table and bring your girlfriends. So when I am asked, why does poker matter? It's a very simple answer. Do you want to negotiate better? Play poker. Do you want to improve your decision making? Play poker. Do you want to gain confidence and change the world? Play poker. So let's get started playing. We have two star instructors with, with us today, both working with Poker Power. The first is Amanda Botfeld. Amanda is the author of A Girl's Guide to Poker. Through grit and determination, she taught herself this game and then went on to win tournaments. She is an expert at breaking down the basics so everyone can learn, have fun, and feel successful. Amanda will speak for the first half of the session and then answer a few questions. After Amanda, I am pleased to introduce our second guest. I'm honored to introduce Xuan Liu, who will cover tips and tricks on tournament strategy. Xuan learned to play poker while in college, and she then went on to travel the globe to compete in the most prestigious tournaments. She sits in the top 20 of the all-time female money list. So you will definitely be learning from two experts today. And with that, I will remind you to sign up for the March 27th tournament by visiting our website, pokerpower.com, or heading on over to World College Poker. Let's learn how to play this game. Amanda? Thank you, Erin. Thank you for the sparkling introduction. All right, I'm excited. So let's get started. I am going to be teaching you the basics, the rules, how to play poker. Share my window and there you go. All right. Welcome everyone. Again, I will be going over the basics. My name is Amanda. I am the author of the book, A Girl's Guide to Poker and an instructor here at Poker Power. And after me, Xuan Liu will take the reins and talk about how to succeed in a tournament. All right, basics. So a common question beginners ask is, what is the goal of poker? What is the objective? And keep it real simple for you. You want to accumulate all the chips. Build up your chip stack. There are actually several different formats for poker. But the kind of poker we practice at Poker Power is what you'll be playing in the tournament next week is no limit Texas Hold'em in a tournament format. Tournament poker is an elimination game, and we in play until the last woman standing has accumulated all the chips. It is survivor style. So, how do we accumulate all the chips? How exactly do we win in poker? Well, you win by having the best hand or by bluffing your opponent. When you play poker, you will be dealt two private hidden cards face down. 
The dealer will deal up to five cards face up. You want to match your hidden private cards to the public community cards to form a winning hand combination. All right, this video is a short introduction on poker and how the cards are dealt and the gameplay rules and the basics. Uh, and we'll go over it in greater detail right after. And it's cute, it's got chips and puppies. Before we get the power, we have to learn the poker. We don't need much. Some friends, a deck of playing cards, and some chips. These chips for betting. And finally, a table. And since we're here to flip the table, we'll do it our way. Poker Power is our name and Texas Hold'em is our game. The rules are simple. Each player is dealt two cards face down. These are called whole cards. They can only be used by the player holding them and should be kept secret. The goal is to make the best five card hand using any combination of your two whole cards and five community cards. Now pay attention, these cards are not dealt all at once. First, you get your whole cards. Then, a round of betting. Betting is how you make decisions in poker. Risk your chips to stay in the hand and win, or fold and save your chips for the next hand. After everyone has made their decision, we see three new cards. This is called the flop, followed by a new round of betting. Next, we see one new card, the turn. Another round of betting takes place. Last is the river, the final community card, followed by one last round of betting. At this point, the hand is over and any remaining players must reveal their whole cards. The best five card hand wins. Okay, but what beats what? The lowest ranked hand is the highest card with no pair or better. Next is a pair. Then two pairs. Then three of a kind. Better still is a straight. Five cards in order, but not of the same suit. Then a flush. Any five cards of the same suit. The next strongest hand is a full house. Three of a kind plus a pair. Finally, the best and rarest hands in Texas Hold'em are four of a kind, straight flush, and royal flush. Now we know this must feel like a lot, so let's recap. We covered whole cards, community cards, the flop, turn, river, and betting. Now that's poker in a nutshell. All right. Now you know everything, right? Just in case you missed anything in that video, let's go over it slowly together. So we're going to go over hand rankings. The lowest possible ranked hand in poker is high card. So you can see here we're dealt, we're dealt an ace and a queen, but there's no ace or queen. So you would just say, I didn't hit anything. I have ace high. Above that is a pair. So we're dealt a queen, the dealer dealt out a queen, we have one pair. Now what's better than one pair? Two pairs. So here we have two aces and two queens, thus two pair. And so it goes one, two, ah, three of a kind. Uh, better than that is three of a kind. And you can see here we have three of the same card, in this case, three aces. All right, now let's get to the really good ones. A straight is five cards in a row. So in this example, we have five cards in a row, ace, king, queen, jack, ten. See that? It's got to be five. Can't be going to be four, Amanda? No, it cannot. Five cards in a row, an ace can be high or low. A flush is five cards of the same suit. So in this example, we have five diamonds, and you can see that they're a little random. They're not necessarily in order. A flush is just five of the same suit. One, two, three, four, five. All right, this is the trickiest one. A full house is three of a kind plus a pair. So we have three aces plus a pair of tens. We have uh, some women that graduated our program, and they're a set of twins, and they say a full house is like twins plus triplets. All right, now the best and rarest hands in poker. 
four of a kind. I think that one's pretty self-explanatory. Then we have a straight flush. That is a straight and a flush combined. So it's five cards in a row, all of the same suit. So here we have eight, nine, 10, Jack, Queen, all of clubs. And finally, what is the best hand in poker? A royal flush. A royal flush is ace, king, queen, jack, 10, specifically all of the same suit. All right, very, very rare hand. That's why it's worth so much. Okay, so keeping in mind the hand strings we just talked about, which hand here is the winner? Let's pretend that player A was dealt a jack and a nine of diamonds, and player B has the king jack of spades. Who made a better match with their cards? Give you a moment. If your answer was king jack of spades, that would be correct. And the reason why is even though the person with jack nine has a good hand, they have three nines, three of a kind, the person with king jack of spades has five spades, which makes a flush. And a flush is better than three of a kind. But don't worry, I might lose some of my chips here too with Jack Nine, if you guessed that one. Okay, one more video. This is a general sense of betting and how it works. Don't worry if you don't catch it all. Oh, uh, we'll be able to walk you through it and you'll be able to, of course, practice in our tournament next week. Before we get the power, we have to learn the poker. In this video, you'll learn that poker isn't just a card game. It's a game about strong decision-making. Of the game. In this lesson, we'll focus on betting. Betting is an opportunity to make a decision. If you are the first player to act, you can bet any amount or pass the action to the next player. If someone else bets, you can match the bet and call or raise the bet and the stakes. Otherwise, you can fold and save your chips for the next hand. Let's practice. Play begins in a clockwise direction, starting to the left of the player who has the dealer button. Directly to the left of the button are two forced bets, known as the small blind and the big blind. The big blind is usually double the amount of the small blind. Once the blinds are posted, the players are dealt two cards each. These are your whole cards. Remember, no one else can see these. Once the whole cards are dealt, the first betting round, called pre-flop, begins. The action begins with the first player to the left of the big blind. Now is a chance to decide if it's worth it to continue in the hand. If a player decides not to play, they simply hold their hand without having to sacrifice any chips. If a player chooses to play their hand, they can call and match the bet or raise the bet. The remaining players must then respond to this player's action with the same options. Before the flop, the blinds act last. After the flop, the player with the button acts last. If you have the button, you have an advantage since you get to see what your opponents do first. Once the pre-flop betting round is complete, three cards are dealt face up at the center of the table. This is called the flop. These are three community cards that all players can use in combination with their whole cards. After the flop is dealt, the next round of betting begins. This round begins with the first remaining player to the left of the dealer button. The player now has two options. Option one is to bet any amount. Option two is to check and pass the action to the next player in turn, who then has the same option. If a player bets on their turn, the next player to act can fold their hand, raise the bet, or call the bet to stay in the hand. Once the betting is complete, we see the turn, which changes the possibilities for the best hand, and players are given a chance to make new decisions. Next, we see the river, the last card to influence the outcome of the hand. A final betting round begins. Anyone who is still in after this round of betting must show their cards. This is called the showdown, and the best five card hand wins. Remember, you can make the best hand using any combination of your two whole cards and the five community cards. 
However, if a player bets and their opponents choose to fold, then they win the pot and don't have to show their cards. We then go on to the next hand, starting over with the same game flip. The dealer button moves clockwise, and so do the blunt. Everyone now has a new position at the table, a new hand, and a new opportunity for decision making. All right, once again, let's break it down a little more slowly. All right, so that video was an introduction to betting and how the action moves around the table. Let's talk more specifically about the gameplay moves, uh, which are betting and raising, checking and folding, and calling. All right, let's start with the moves that can be toughest for most people. Betting is if you're the first person to put chips in the pot, so you can bet 500 chips, 1,000 chips, all your chips, whatever you want. Raising is the same thing, except someone else has already put chips in. So let's say that Gina bet 50 chips. You can raise her bet to maybe 150. Or if Jessica bet 10,000 chips, you might want to raise her to 30,000 chips. Betting and raising are the aggressive moves in poker, and they take confidence. Making aggressive moves is how you take control and leadership over the hand. So, a little sizing guideline here. How much should you better raise? Generally, three times. So if Jen bet 100 chips, you might want to raise her to 300. Or if the big blind, that's the minimum price to play a hand, is 500, you'll usually want to make it around 1,500 chips. Betting serves a dual purpose. It helps us get value if we have a good hand and bluff if we have a not so good hand. In both cases, it's good to bet big. Here's why. Because if you have a good hand, you wanna get paid off. Bet big, make the max. And if you have a bad hand, you wanna bet big to scare your opponents away. You need to bet a lot of chips in order for to get them to fold. See, so we play poker in a polarized fashion. And if your hand does not fall into either of these categories, you don't have to bet. All right, and remember, if you are bluffing, which I hope you will be doing, people do not fold to baby bets. You want to make their decision difficult, not easy. So especially when you are bluffing, bluff big. Go for it, apply pressure. All right, and now here is my favorite slide. Folding is a huge part of the game. Folding takes discipline. As a matter of fact, professional poker players usually fold around 80% of their cards before the flop. That's right. Professional poker players fold around 80% of their hands. All the time, I get into an Uber car and they say, hey, what do you do? And I say, hey, I got a book about poker. And they say, great, how do I get better at poker? And I say, the answer is fold. If you're asking that question and you want to get better at poker, you're probably not folding enough. And don't settle for bad cards. All right. Now remember that checking is an option as well. Checking means no bet. It is a pass. To check in poker, you double tap your cards with your fingers. Or in live poker, you can simply announce check. All right. And let's talk about calling. Calling is responding to others rather than others responding to you. So if Susanna bets 100 chips and you call, then you're calling the price that she made up. You are allowing her to choose the amounts. It's like playing poker as a backseat driver. She is in the driver's seat because she is setting the price. It's a little bit passive. A lot of beginners, they think poker's bingo, and they think, oh, I'm just gonna call chips and call chips and whatever they bet, I'm just gonna call to stay along. Poker's not bingo. All right, and on the subject, final slide of folding, this is the money slide. Uh, if you were say, hey, I love poker, I wanna learn this game, but my real goal is to beat my cousin Todd, try this slide. Okay, so the best way to win in poker is to only play, is play better cards than your opponents. 
generally speaking, think of only play cards in these three categories. Pairs, any and all pairs. If the dealer deals you a pair of nines, play it. Pair of threes, play it. Pair of kings, play it. That one's simple. Face cards. By this, I mean both cards 10 and higher. So if you're dealt a king and a nine of clubs, fold it. Not good enough. If you're dealt an ace and a three, let it go. Let it go. I know it's painful. You want both cards to be good. The most common two mistakes we see beginners make is A, they think that any two cards of the same suit are good. Not necessarily the case. King four, it's not good even if they're both diamonds. And the second thing is a lot of times they think they should play any ace. And that's not necessarily the case. You want both cards 10 and up. Because when your cousin has king seven, you're going to have king jack. All right. And finally, the last category is suited connectors. And by suited connectors, I mean cards of the same suit that are consecutive. So nine, eight of spades, seven, six of clubs, five, four of diamonds. If you're dealt a 10 and a nine of different suits, should you play it? No, no, fold it. Only play above average hands. And I promise you that will give you an edge on the competition. And that's what we have today on my end. Uh, and before I see if there's any questions, I want to remind you that next week on Saturday, we have a poker tournament. So please join. And Alec, I believe we have questions. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so that's a very, very good question. Sometimes your hand isn't good enough to bet with. So remember those two categories? You want to bet because you're trying to get paid off or you're betting because you're trying to bluff and scare your opponent away. You're betting with your good hands, your bad hands. Sometimes your hand's medium. If you have a more medium hand, then you can call and see what your opponent does. Does that help? Basically, you, um, you either want to better fold with your really good hands and your really bad hands, that polarized fashion. And if your hand is medium, that's when you can call. Yes. Absolutely. That's a great question. So uh, the reason why they're called blinds is that is short for blind bet. It's almost like you had to bet chips without seeing your cards. And when you have blinds, it kind of uh, anchors what the stakes are for the game. So you'll know, do I need 10 chips to play this game or a thousand chips to play this game? So it anchors the stakes and uh, it also helps determine the order at the table. And when there's more chips in the pot, it actually changes whether it's mathematically profitable to stay in a hand. So if the blinds are really, really, really expensive, it actually will change your decision on which cards to play. Great questions. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I hope you have fun with your mind. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Wow, how fun was that? Um, I really wish I had Amanda teaching me poker when I was starting out. Uh, let me share my camera right now. Um, okay. Share my screen. Okay, so today we're going to talk a bit about how tournaments are structured, how to ship strategy depending on how many chips you have, and when to go all in. And of course, how to navigate different stages of the tournament. Um, sorry, I think I missed the first slide. Um, if you guys don't know who I am, welcome. My name is Xuan Liu. Um, I've loved poker for almost my entire life. 
um, I fell in love with Texas Hold'em, the variety we're going to be playing uh, next week. Around the time when I was in university, um, and I got to relay my love of the game into a career that spanned many, many years, and I got to travel the world and play in some of the top tournaments, and I'm super grateful. Um, and this chapter of my life, I'm super thankful that Poker Power exists uh, for me uh, to carry on the mission that I've lived most of my life to other women. Okay, so now we're going to talk about poker. Um, Okay, so remember that poker tournaments are a survival style game, okay? So there's only going to be one winner. There's going to be different prizes, but one person in the end is going to have all of the chips. Um, tournaments are how poker is played at the biggest stages, including the World Series of Poker, and of course our tournament next week. <clears throat> poker tournaments play down to a winner. Sorry. <clears throat> okay, so... We're going to look at this typical um, structure example in the tournament. So we don't know the exact structure of next week's event yet. We're going um, to have it last about two to three hours. So it'll probably go a bit faster than this. But as we know, in poker, information is power. So anytime you um, sit down at a poker tournament, you're going to want to take a look at the structure. Maybe you want to plan your dinner breaks. Um, uh, and um, other breaks um, and just see how many levels you're going to have to play that day before you move on to the next day. So here's an example of what prizes in a tournament might look like. Um, of course, next week's tournament is going to be a complete free roll, um, nothing whatsoever to join. So there's not even going to be a rake. But this is a standard uh, prize pool where the first place is going to get between 15 to 25% of the entire prize pool, depending on how many entrants there are. And typically, um, it's going to pay about 10 to 15% of the field, which just means that 85 to 90% of the players are going to go home with absolutely nothing. But that's okay because, as you'll see, we're playing to win. So let's talk about the tournament mindset. We know that we want to dictate the pace and force our opponents to respond to us. The key here is the mindset of playing to win versus playing not to lose. If you're playing to win, you do whatever it's necessary to move forward. You aggressively try to put points on the board. You're not reckless, but you're certainly not passive. When you play to win, you make the call that you fear. But when you're playing to lose, you're cautious. You're, you want to avoid making mistakes, so you hold back. Instead of doing what you know you need to do, you wait to react. And that's what we want to try to avoid. And the best way um, to play to win is to gain confidence and um, fluency in the game. So let's talk a bit about stealing. In cash games, um, the blinds never go up. Cash games are games where you sit down and continue to buy back if you run out of chips. Uh, generally, in a cash game, there are dollar values. So each dollar you see in a cash game is exactly $1. But in tournaments, it's quite different. Um, you might buy into a $100 tournament and get 10 or 20,000 chips. Um, meaning, so in tournaments, remember, because the blinds go up, you need to keep accumulating chips to survive. And so one really excellent way of doing this um, with relatively small risk most of the time is by stealing the blinds. This means that you have a hand that doesn't really want to call, say, a weak ace in late position, and the goal is to take down the pot pre-flop. Late position is the best place to steal the blind since you don't have a lot of people acting behind you. In the later levels of tournaments, there will be an ante in addition to the blinds, so, is the, so there's going to be more money in the pot to steal every hand, making it more beneficial if you can steal a pot. And remember, um, once antes are added in, um, there's going to be even more to fight for. For example, if blinds are at 500, 1,000, um, there's often a 100 ante from either the button or each player, meaning there's going to be 2,400 in the preflop pot instead of just the 1,500 you would get from the small blind and the big blind. 
So as stacks get shallower later in tournaments, you can experiment with raising to less than three times the big blind. Try two or two and a half times and see if your raises are able to steal the blinds. If no one's really playing back at you, um, you're probably in the golden zone of the rates raise size. If you're always making it two times the big blind and players are play, playing back at you, you might want to make it a bit more. Um, stealing blinds utilizes the power position and should be a part of your game. Just don't do it every orbit or else people will start playing back at you, which of course is completely fine if you're comfortable um, playing post-flop, especially in position. If you suspect someone else is stealing the blinds with reckless abandon, you can re-steal. Remember, you can re-raise, re-bet, pre-flop, and hope that the raiser is stealing and will fold your, your um, aggression. Now, let's talk a bit about stack sizes. In tournaments, the blinds are always going up. The absolute number of chips you have doesn't tell the best story of how you're doing. The best way to keep track of your stack and know what moves are available to you is by always being conscious of how many chips you have relative to the big blind, or we just say your big blind stack. A player's stack size is extremely important and it's something that changes frequently. Grouping stack sizes in different areas can allow you to make better, more simplistic decisions pre-flop. When you're a short stack, you have to be careful about how you allocate your chips. And often you'll, you'll want to have only one move, which is all in. And we'll definitely talk more about that next. When you're a medium stack, you can take some chances and see some flops, as well as put some pressure on other players, but you'll still want to be careful or, you're, or you'll become a short stack. And of course, when you're a big stack, you can often put pressure on other stacks since you're at no risk to be eliminated. We won't cover too much on this topic here, but it's important to reduce uh, to introduce the, con uh, the concept of an effective stack as well. Even if you're a big stack, um, but the three opponents left to act behind you have a much smaller stack, effectively, um, you want to uh, use the same strategy you would as if you had a short stack as well. So in this example, um, we have a short stack here with six big blinds and a large stack here with 40 big blinds um, if blinds were 500, 1,000. Again, you would just divide the total number of chips you have by the big blind. So in this case, the 6,500 divided by the 1,000 would be around six big blinds and the 40,000 chips divided by 1,000 is 40 big blinds. Okay, so this um, is a really helpful graphic to keep in mind at the table, right? Um, we always want to visualize what our opponent's stack sizes are, um, even before, you know, their handles, their uh, tendencies, things like that. It's very important um, you know, if you're playing as a small blind here, for example, on six big blinds, um, generally, if you have a very good hand, you're just going to want to go all in. You don't want to raise it and have to play pre post flop um, and potentially make a mistake there. Same thing with the 12 big blinds and the eight big blinds. Basically, the only moves to you are to go all in. Um, less so the 12 and the 15 um, in these stacks the 12, 15, the 18, and the 25, um, you can definitely raise fold to an extent. Um, but keep in mind that sometimes it's still just better to go all in and not give your opponents an opportunity um, to potentially hit something post-flop on you um, when you can very easily pick up a lot of chips risk-free. Um, here, if you have a 32 or 40 big blind stack, you're going to be one of the chip leaders and you're going to be able to put a lot of pressure on your opponents, especially the short stacks. Um, so you're going to look especially to steal the blinds from these 12, 15, 18, and 25 big blind stacks um, because versus their stacks, you can raise and fold with a bad hand 
Whereas if you're raising into a super short stack, like the eight big blind or the six big blind, um, generally you'll probably have to call off um, if they do go all in because you're kind of pot committed in that situation. So be wary, um, your hand's still very important. So a good rule of thumb is when you have 10 big blinds or less, any hand you're playing at the stack size should be an all-in or a shove. You risk 10 big blinds to win the blinds and antes. So if you're successful, you can add 25% to your stack. If someone raises before you, you'll never just want to call. You don't have enough chips to be calling and trying to hit flops. Do this a few times and miss and you'll be out. One exception would be if you have aces or kings and believe your opponents are very weak. Um, you can simply raise these hands since you really don't want to get a call with them, since you really do want to get a call with them and you want action um, because your all-in might be too strong. So, hi everybody, so sorry about that. We're just having some technical difficulties here, but I think we're good to go. Um, I think we left off when I was talking about going all in. Um, please write in the chat if we're missing something or if you'd like me to repeat anything that's unclear. Um, but basically, when we have 10 big blinds or less, we definitely just want to go all in. Because if you're successful, you can add up to 25% of your stack, basically um, risk-free if no one calls you. So if someone raises before you, you never want to just call. You're going to want to steal and re-steal pretty leniently on these stacks, especially if you think that your opponents are um, quite conservative. So one exception is if you have a super strong hand like aces or kings and believe your opponents are very weak and don't have much of a hand to call you with. Um, in these situations, you can simply raise and um, hope to get a call and uh, not get outflopped. Remember, um, we want to play to win. We do what's necessary to move forward and we aggressively want to put points on the board. Um, most of the money in a tournament prize pool is going to be concentrated at the top. We're not uh, just avoiding a loss or you know, trying not to finish last in last place because last place and you know, the top 16 percentile is, is going to pay the same. Um, you definitely want to play to accumulate all of the chips. So, the stages of the tournament refer to how far you've progressed. Many players simply play each stage the same way, but as a rule of thumb, you should be more aggressive in the later stages of a tournament, especially if you have a good stack, rather than the early ones. Remember, the blinds are smallest at the start, so there's no need for big risks in order to pick up extra chips. Keep in mind that if you can create a tight image, you can potentially earn more respect from your opponents and open up your game and play more hands in position in the later stages. Let's take a closer look at these stages. Oops. So early stages, when every single player is still in, um, is when you want to be cautious about committing too many of your chips. Since remember, a tournament is a marathon and not a sprint. You can't win at the first level. You can play every pot and you know triple up a stack, but um, you know the tournament's going to be going on for several more levels, and it's what happens in the end that matters. Preserve your stack if you can, since the blinds don't go up too quickly. But also, don't be afraid to play if you have a strong hand, especially versus weaker players. Weaker players at this stage in the tournament will often be doing exactly. Um, what we're trying to teach you not to do. So things like limping, playing too many hands, um, these players will eventually be eliminated by probably making a mistake, getting into a too risky situation with a subpar hand. So if you spot an opponent um, having these tendencies, try to play pots with them um, and hope that their chips go to you and not somebody else. So in the middle stages, this is when an ante has usually kicked in in addition to the blinds, and some of the field will have been eliminated. As the blinds increase, the value of winning pots preflop does as well. So now is a good time to use that solid image you've cultivated and uh, open up a little. 
identify which players are very conservative and try to steal their blinds. This is a stage that um, you want to be making a lot of calculated, calculated risks to accumulate chips. So the closer you get to being in the money, which is uh, placing in a position that receives a prize, the tighter people tend to play. Um, because of course, a lot of players are gonna have this mindset like, you know, they played for so long already, they don't wanna go home empty handed. So identify who these players are um, and you'll be able to find situations to steal pots from them because they're really not gonna to wanna to be involved with you um, unless they have a very strong hand. Um, let's talk about the bubble. So this is the point in the poker tournament when players are about to reach the prize stage. So for example, if, if a tournament paid the top 100 players and a few more players that remain, um, say anywhere from one to five players, um, then they're on the bubble. We don't want to have come all this way to be eliminated, um, so, but no one else does either. So keep that in mind, um, but always be conscious of your stack and the other stacks at your tables. So if you have a short stack, you'll want to be pretty careful about where you go all in, um, but you can't really fold down to nothing either. So choose spots where you're in late position and have a decent hand to try to pick up a pot and survive. Of course, you can still always go all in um, if you have a very strong hand, or you can re-steal versus some players who are playing too loose at this stage. If you have a medium stack, you can still play some hands, but be cautious about playing in situations where your opponents have more chips than you um, and can therefore eliminate you. You don't want to get eliminated on the bubble and let super short stacks make it in instead of you um, when you could have slid in there pretty risk-free. So you can put pressure on stacks that are shorter than you, but generally try to avoid playing against stacks that have more chips than you. Um, and if you're the big stack, this is a really fun place to be. You can potentially bully the other players at the table, raising preflop nonstop and taking advantage of players not wanting to bust. Just remember, if a player is very aggressive versus you, it's likely because they have an extremely strong hand and they don't think they will bust. So maybe that's a good time to dial it back. Uh, so navigating the bubble smartly is very important and takes a huge amount of skill, um, but something to keep in mind. Big picture, if all your wins are where you barely squeak into the money and take home the minimum prize, then you're not going to be making much money overall. Um, our goal isn't just to make the money and squeeze in there. Our goal is to win. So after the bubble bursts, often there's a mass exodus. Uh, players who were hanging out for dear life have now made the money and are, happy, and are happy to gamble with what they have left. Your goal in the late stages of a tournament should be to build a big stack um, and try to make it to the final table. But now, the final table, my favorite place to be. Um, it, it's the pinnacle of poker tournaments and it's extremely exciting. Overall, don't be afraid, be aggressive, use your reads and play to win. In live tournaments, sometimes deals are made to chop. The remaining money in the prize pool, um, since there can often be big leaps from prize to prize. If you're in this situation, make sure you don't get run over by people who are trying to force you to make a deal. If you think you can negotiate for more money of the pool, do so. This is a great opportunity to use your reads on your opponent. If someone's desperate to make a deal, sometimes you can get more than your fair share. Negotiate smart, and if all else fails, say no and play to a winner. Remember, on any given day, anything can happen. If you're playing to a winner, you'll want to be aware of a concept called ICM, standing for Independent Chip Model. Simplified, this means that chips you lose are worth more than the chips you gain, since how many chips you have doesn't necessarily equate to the place you will finish. So you could take second place with 100 chips, 100,000 chips, or one chip if everybody busted before you. But that means that practice is important to not bust out and let shorter stacks than you take a higher place, much like on the bubble. The key here is to pressure on stacks that are shorter than you and be careful versus stacks that are bigger than you. Let's take a closer look. 
Okay. Let's not take a closer look because that's actually all for our tournament strategy for today. Um, the rest of it you can um, find out if you join Poker Power. We're trying to teach one million women how to play poker. Thank you all so much for joining us, especially through our technical difficulties. Um, I'm going to relay back to Aaron with some final words. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Sean. Uh, that was fantastic. And thank you, Amanda. I will tell you that I have been through our Poker Power lessons uh, three times. And every time I listen to one of our great teachers speak, I learn something new. Um, at Poker Power, we have a proprietary curriculum of 12 total lessons. So today we just gave you a teaser of what we do in our clubs every week um, and the classes that we run. We also have advanced learnings and we have one-on-one -on -one coaching opportunities from our teachers. Um, I'm really grateful for everyone being here today and listening. I want to highlight one more time our March 27th tournament. I know there was a bit of a question in the chat, so just to be very clear, the way that you register for the tournament is you go to worldcollegepoker.com, scroll down just a little bit, and you're going to see the button to register on. That will then take you to pokerstars.net, where you need to set up an account if you don't have one. From then, you come back to the World College site, Put in your details, verify that you are 18 and female, and you will receive a ticket for the tournament by Friday this week, so on the 26th. Um, so don't, don't worry that you're not registered, you are. You'll receive your ticket on Friday. And then we hope to see many, many women from across the globe uh, playing in this tournament. It is a free tournament, there are no buy-ins, and there are fantastic prizes. Um, so again, if there are no further questions, I will uh, thank World College Poker for hosting this. Um, big thanks to Alec Rome for being our mission control. And one more thank you to our two fabulous teachers, Amanda Botfeld and Schwamberg. Thank you.